Hi everyone, my name is Joris Peels, and this is another edition of 3D Printing News Unpeeled. And today we're going to be looking at some research from CMU, Carnegie Mellon University, and that is knitting. Now, so there have been some 3D printing knitting applications, well, if we make soft things um, before, but this is something that really surprised me because this is a solid kind of knitting process that uh, one particular researcher has been working on for over 10 years. And I'm surprised at how amazing this is because it, to me, you can knit things like furniture or other household objects. Then you can take them apart, wash them, things like that, and reconstitute them as different objects. And to me, this is a really new world because you really suck at flexible things. And if it's flexible, then it's something like TPU and stuff. And, we, and it's really, really difficult for us to get things that are sustainable, flexible, and that last a long time in the world. But imagine doing all sorts of things with shoes and all sorts of things with uh, lots of household stuff with this. I think it's a really, really new area for us. And I'm also completely surprised that I've never heard of this. I, I've, 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 I've uh, you know, looked at some of the other knitting processes, the 3D knitting, like making the t-shirts and stuff fit you better. I've looked at the knitting processes, like the fly knit type of processes for shoes and stuff, and I had just never encountered this. I'm quite amazed by this. So Yuishi Hiros has been working on this for over 10 years, and he really literally started making uh, knitting himself by hand, and then uh, uh, ended up making more and more sophisticated uh, knitting machines. So now he's worked with James McCann, uh, who's a software professor, and then basically made software for the newest device that makes it a lot easier to operate and makes them be able to make uh, things. They've actually uh, made augmented stip stitch volumes, which is the ways how to connect these different blocks, and uh, they have like you know, code fragments that are these blocks that you can copy paste and use like this. And they have a, a, a language. They have a computer language that's called Solid Knit Out. I think this is fantastic. And uh, Mark Gillespie worked on this, Angelica Bonilla, uh, and James McCann, and Yurishiro Rosa. And I think this is something that I'm like really, since I found this, and, and I found this really kind of coincidentally, I've been thinking about all sorts of things we can do with this, and I'm actually quite uh, amazed at how sustainable this could be, how you could use recycled yarn with this, how you could recycle the things you make, and how you can make all sorts of uh, industrial stuff as well with this. And I think, yeah, this is a really, really wonderful thing they're working on. But a bit of a kind of like, you know, you don't expect it, let's say. So so that's really, really good, and it makes us really uh, very inspirational. Now, another thing that is inspirational is holographic sound printing uh, or holographic direct sound printing. So we've had certain direct sound printing processes already. They've been around for a while. Um, and, um, oh, this is the knitting machine, by the way, sorry. The, 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 <laughs> that's a rather complex. You can see how complex this knitting machine is. And this is actually the, the holographic direct sound printing uh, image. Um, so this is research by Mahdi uh, Drafiyar, Mohsen Habibi, Rama Bahat, and Mukturman Paksirme. Uh, and apologies for if I got your names wrong there. Uh, they got it published in Nature Communications, very prestigious. And basically, they've come up with a holographic direct sound printing. So we've had direct sound printing processes to use sound, ultrasound, to induce uh, polymerization or induce cavitation that induces polymerization locally, right? Um, then we've also had volumetric processes like zoology and all these other processes that, that, that are printing the whole thing in the uh, in one go. And these guys are using this spinning, this holographic process, and the sound printing in one go. Um, so what happens is locally at one a particular voxel, these guys can induce cavitation uh, and get polymerization at that particular location, right? Um, so this is a, a really crazy process um, that. The one thing that is many that is very very exciting about this is direct uh, remote distance printing. So remote distance printing means that I can print. I can put the printer outside the human body, for example, and print something inside of the body, or I could print inside of a particular vessel. Um, and and that could be really interesting. You could, for example, implant the three D printing material and then make the implant inside the body. Now, of course, we're ages ages away from doing this, right? Um, we, we should realize this. Uh, but at the same time. Uh, you know, this is a very different thing. Now, they say this is remarkably much more faster than the other direct sound printing processes. It makes use of a robot arm. Uh, now, the interesting thing about that, of course, is that you could picture an object or a larger object or a series of objects being made by just a series of robot arms, right? They're also demonstrating multi-material capabilities here. And they say they can use heat uh, carrying thermostats and other materials that maybe are a little bit less... Uh, uh, applicable, usable in, in the existing processes. So I think that's, uh, again, super exciting news. Uh, the next one is something I've seen before, but I think people haven't been paying enough attention because this is really, really great. Um, 
So the University of Bath uh, has a method where which, by which maybe they can use 3D printing to create objects with a really, really large surface area, relatively inexpensive objects. Uh, they call them monoliths. Um, and these objects could remove about three quarters of the, uh, the uh, PFOA uh, chemicals from water. Um, these are fast chemicals, PFAS. These are very, very harmful chemicals. Um, they're ev in everyone, essentially, and they're probably uh, carcinogenic. They probably uh, uh, inhibit or some kind of, uh, are a negative for human reproduction, and they probably cause all sorts of problems, but it's difficult to cause to do research on these things because they're in most, all, most of all humans. Um, they're also used in all of your pans, all these Teflon things, Gore-Tex jackets, most of them anyway. A lot of cosmetics as well uh, use these. They're great at being nonstick, taking water away, doing coatings and stuff like that. But I think, um, yes, it's, 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 this is a disaster. That's an ongoing disaster that people are doing. And you're always probably wondering, why isn't there more re regulation? Why are there more people blocking these, these PFAS and uh, chemicals, even though they're carcinogenic and they're used in pans, right? Well, this is a $28 billion industry, just the chemicals themselves, the ingredients, not the stuff made from them, which is, of course, a much larger industry. Um, so at the moment, there's no real scalable economical way to get them out of water, right? Theoretically, these are going to be called the forever chemicals. Um, and it's really difficult to get them out of the water supply and they end up in all everybody. Um, so this may be a really, really inexpensive way of doing this. Uh, so this is a really kind of really uh, scalable 3D printing solution. Um, it's been made by Alison Stefan Martins, Garfella Zubuli, Shan Yi, Antonio Esposito, Yanis Wenk, David Mattia. And essentially, they just use the, the, these monoliths. They, they just use them to, to, to create like a four centimeter high little monolith out of ceramic Indian oxide material. And, uh, and then the chemical sticks to them. About 75%, so not everything. But hey, it's a huge improvement. And one could easily see how this could have an industrial application. How you could do this at scale very, very inexpensively. So I think that's, that's very exciting. Uh, anyway, my name is Joris Peels. This is another edition of uh, 3D Printing News Unpeeled. And I hope you found this 